Bible this morning. Okay, I got my mic on. You got your book. Uh, if you have your Bible this morning, turn to 1 John chapter 2. Not a very deep message this morning, just one you ought to ever keep in mind. 1 John chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 15 to 17. The title of the message is Seven Reasons Not to Love the World. You're told in 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now you know, uh, whenever you're reading 1 John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, you've got to remember that uh, some of this is going to have tribu tribulation application, there's church age application, there's even millennial application in this book. And um, the reason I say that is, it says the love of the Father is not in him. Romans 5.5 5 says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. But there's two ways to take it. Yes, you have the love of God in you. There's just no love of the Father in you. In other words, there's no personal love of him. So that, may, that stands true with the verse. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father. In other words, your love for the Father is not in you. Does that make sense? Okay. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Again, you think, he that doeth the will of God. Well, the Bible says it's, God, it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, right? So someone that, who's doing the will of God, the first thing they'll do is what? They'll get saved. They'll repent. And believe on Christ. So when he says, uh, He that doeth the will of God abideth forever, that's the truth. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, may you bless the message now. May Father, we, uh, may we divest ourselves of this world. May we look at it the way you look at it. May we feel about it the way you feel about it. May we see the truth about it. May Father, we not be enamored by it. And definitely not being led away with it. Help us, Lord, to realize that this world's against you and we're against it. And that's all there is to it. And, Father, just pray that you help me to get that across this morning. Pray that you bless those uh, on the prayer list, Lord, those traveling, those sick. Uh, there's some that have suffered loss, Lord, in their lives, and they just need prayer. And, Father, the other things on the prayer list, Lord, you know what they are. Just pray for missionaries that are in trouble and going through uh, troublesome times and Families that have gone through, uh, that are going through tough times, Lord, we do pray your blessing and help on them. And just pray that you bless the message this morning. May it speak to someone here and um, may they realize what, where they're at and where they should be. And uh, as far as their attitude toward this world, we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. You know, um, Demas was a fellow laborer of Paul. He's mentioned three times in the Pauline epistles, and it says, you know, Paul said, you know, Demas greeteth you, you know. I mean, he was, he was with Paul. In fact, I kind of figured out that he's with Paul approximately six years. That's a long time to walk with the apostle and to minister by his side. There's no reason to believe that Demas is an unsaved man, none. Everything in... Listen, if Paul can't discern whether the guy that's traveled with him for six years is a saved man or not, Paul shouldn't even been an apostle. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, he knew, and Demas was a saved man. And it says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. A Christian can love the world and not love God. Now, he has the love of God in him because Jesus Christ is in you. But you have no love of the Father. You have no love of God in your life because you love the world. Listen, if you love the world, you don't love God because they're, they're opposed to one another. Now, I'm not talking about the trees and the grass and the mountains and the meadows. I understand that. I love outdoors. You know? I mean, I, I, I love the creation even though it's fallen. You can't help but love it. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a world system here. We're talking about a system that's put in place that if you've only been saved for about, what, five to ten years, man, your estimation of that thing gets less and less every year to the point where you don't care whether God sets it on fire today. Uh, how many of you say, I hate this world? 
I say it all the time, but I'm not talking about God's creation, okay? I'm talking about a world system that is against my God. And because it's against Him, it's against me. Now look at in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. We covered this verse on Wednesday night when we we're going through Ecclesiastes verse by verse. There's a question, why does God tell us not to love the world when He puts the world in our hearts to begin with? And that's exactly what the verse says. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He hath made everything beautiful in His time. And it is, man, isn't it? I mean, you know, when spring breaks and the flowers start coming up, even a snowstorm looks beautiful after it's over with. Sometimes it's beautiful while it's going on. I love storms. Any kind of storm. Now, I don't like snow, but I, I love the storm part. I don't like so much rain, but I love the, the uh, thunder and lightning. I love all that stuff. I love the cloud formations. I just, I, I love it. I'd be out in the storm. We used to go out there. We didn't care too much for our lives and dance around in the storm. We used to take the kids out when it's pouring down rain, two inches of rain on the ground. It's raining so hard, and we'd all go out and play in the driveway in the rain. That's something we like to do because we like storms. And it, to me, those things are beautiful. And, uh, but it says there, he has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work of God, uh, the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. In other words, you don't know what's after you. You don't know what's going to happen. God sets the world in your heart. Well, why in the world would he do that? And then tell you that if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Well, listen, as a lost man, if he didn't do that, you wouldn't have any care for your own life. You ever thought about getting saved? It's pretty selfish. I mean, the first act uh, the, you know, the, uh, in obedience to God is actually a selfish act on our part. I know why I got saved. I didn't want to go to hell. <laughs> that is completely selfish. And how I know that and how I take care for this, God has set the world in my heart so that I would care about myself enough to listen to his gospel. But after I've got that gospel, he says, get that world out of your heart. <laughs> get it out of your heart. He's got it there, it's just so you're, listen, it's your world, isn't it? When you're lost, come on now, isn't it your world? You're thinking, well, that's so-and-so, but this is my world. I mean, that's what you're thinking. I mean, you're not, you know, you're not so bold and so arrogant. This is my world. But in your conscience, this is all about you. When you're unsaved, man, it is all about you. All you're thinking about is your life. I mean, now the people that are affected around you, oh, you care about because, listen, that affects you. Y'all get that? Am I just talking? Am I the only one that's that wicked? <laughs> or do y'all know what I'm talking about? And as a Christian, that's to go. Man, whew, complete reversal. Where you actually care about somebody that you don't care about. You just meet somebody and you care about their soul because they're lost because God said to care about them. They have no effect. They cannot add. Listen, true love in the Bible, that's why it calls it charity in 1 Corinthians 13. You know why that's the correct word? Because love is a handout to somebody that can't give it back to you. God gave a handout to you, didn't he? And you can't give back to him. You can't earn it. You can't merit it. You can't Justify it. The only thing you can do is receive it. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ Lord. That's why it's called charity. So God set that world in your heart so that you care about what happens to yourself. That you see the dilemma you're in. You've got everything going on around you and then all of a sudden God just brings this truth your way. And he convicts that heart and he tells you, you need to be saved. But once you are saved, then he says, get that world out of your heart. All you can know is understand the way of the world. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Before you're saved, don't you look at Christians like they're a bunch of fools. Don't you even look at the Oh, it's a bunch of foolishness. I tried to read that. It's foolishness. But after you get saved, all of a sudden, it starts making a lot of sense. Why? It says, Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You know, the Bible says, What knoweth the things of God save the Spirit of God? It's interesting, after you get saved and get the Spirit of God, you start knowing the things of God. You know, know what, know what the, 
the spirit of man save, or what knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man? To know what, to know what really goes on in a human, you have to be human. Why do you think God became flesh so he would know what men go through? What knoweth a man save the spirit of man? Listen, do you know what a dog goes through? No, because you don't have the spirit of a dog. But if God can turn you into a dog for a day, then you know. <laughs> God became a man so he could know. He could not just say that, yeah, I know this happens. He could experience it. You became a Christian so you would know what it's like to be spiritually, to have the mind of Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, 5 says, They that are of the world, it says, They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. The world knows their own, okay? They know their own. Uh, you are not going to, listen, if you get saved, and if you are saved here this morning, if you are saved here this morning, I got good news and bad news. One, you're accepted of God and you're going to heaven. The bad news is the world will never accept you now, even if you try to blend in. They can smell that you're different. I'm telling you. They can sense it. They can smell it. They can detect it, no matter how you try to hide it. And they will hate you as much as they hate the ones that's living right for God. You say, why? Nobody loves a hypocrite. Nobody. And since you can't reverse that thing, you might as well just live for God. After you're converted, you're to get the world out of your heart. Love not the world, neither the things in the world, he says. Um, everything in this world... No, let me say this. If everything you do is ultimately to fill your own belly, then you love the world. That's all you need to ask yourself. Uh, Philippians 3, verse 18 and 19 says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Everything is about what you have right now in front of you and what you have around you, what you can get and what you can't get. If that's all you mind is earthly things, well, you have the love of the world in your heart. There's to be something else there. It's not to say that you can't enjoy the things that God gives you. I'm not against that. The Bible's not against that. The Bible says He gives us richly all things to enjoy. I'm asking you, do you love God? Or all do you think about is this world? Because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. He is the one that's worthy of your love. Everything takes second place to that. Ecclesiastes 6, 7 says, All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. You realize that? What everybody does for an entire lifetime is to feed themselves, ultimately. I've told you before that if you start going through hard times, you'll sell everything you have, including your furniture, your car, everything to feed yourself. Because if you don't feed yourself, you're going to die. So all the labor ultimately is for the mouth of a man. But when you get saved, there's something else. There's labor for God. There's labor for, toward the eternal things that the world knows nothing about. They just don't know anything about it. They can't get a grasp of it. So here's seven reasons why you should, why you, uh, seven reasons not to love the world. Number one, this world did not save you, nor could it. I don't know why you think you owe it anything. Not only could it not save you, it wouldn't save you. It certainly wouldn't tell you. It wasn't the world that told me how to be saved, it was another Christian or it was a gospel track, or it was a preaching message, but it wasn't the world. I didn't get this on ABC, CBS, and Fox News, did you? You owe the world nothing. Nothing. Psalm 3, 8 says, Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the world's not responsible for it. <laughs> well... In one way they are, they, they killed him, <laughs> they crucified him. But, they're, but God's the one that brought salvation to us. So you don't owe the world anything in that respect. They would let you perish, by the way. They would let you die and go to hell and spend eternity in hell, and that they'd be just as fine with that. Second thing is, this world is not your home. That's right. When you got saved, you changed citizenship. Or you became a dual citizen. Bible says we are citizens of a different country. 
Hebrews 11:16 says, But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. I know maybe you don't believe that. But the Lord Jesus Christ, who was a carpenter in this, on, while He was on this earth, He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may be also. He's coming back. But He said He's preparing a place. It's not here. So, if you're saved here this morning, this world is not your home. You are like a pilgrim. You are like a stranger just wandering through, trying to do the will of God while you're going through it. That's not to say you can't have a home down here, but don't look at it as home. <laughs> the older you get, the more that'll be home. I understand, man, you can get comfortable, you know, and you, you think you're just going to... Oh, you just think you're going to tear it up, man. Once you get your home, you're going to build it just the way you want, or you're going to have it just the way... You, you'll never, ever have exactly a, the way you want. Ever. Trust me. And if you do, somebody will take it away from you, like the bank. <laughs> um, but that place is reserved for me. It's, it's, it says it's reserved in heaven. It's there for me. I know it's there. Hebrews 13, 14 says, For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. 1 Peter 2, 11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers, strangers and pilgrims, abstain from flesh and lust which war against the soul. Strangers and pilgrims. That's what we become. This world's no longer your home. If it was, you'd get along with the world, the world would get along with you. But the world's not going to like you the way you are. This world is in direct opposition to the sun. That is a, uh, a physical truth. This world rotates in the exact opposite uh, direction that the sun rotates. They rotate against each other. And that's the way it is uh, between the... Uh, he, and by the way, he's called the S-U-N of righteousness in Malachi 4.2. Uh, the sun is actually a type of the S-O-N. And you know what? In direct, the world is in direct opposition to the Son. This world is in direct opposition to Jesus Christ. Always has and always will be. Um, he said in Galatians 6, 14, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Yep. This world is crucified unto me. It's, it should be dead to me because I'm dead to it. If you don't see that, if you've not been saved long enough, not been in the book long enough, or not experienced it, but you're dead to this world. You're dead to it and it should be dead to you. In uh, Galatians 1, 4, he says, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. I think it takes a little time. You know, it's like these, uh, these college kids and teenagers coming out of high school. They've, they've, they've had these teachers that are bombard them with uh, fantasy and false doctrine and socialism and how everything could just be wonderful if somebody else would just pay for it, of course. Well, wait till you're working and paying for it. <laughs> they say, you know, when you're, you're a liberal when you're young and you get more conservative as you go. Now, if you're already a conservative and you're young, praise God you're halfway there, you know. But you'll find out. But you know, this, this world, all you have to do is stand there and just turn on the news and just watch the news constantly for a week. And man, you're just... You're absolutely amazing. And you can't believe the stuff that's going on. You can't believe how wicked things really are. And I'm talking about government. And we live in one of the best countries on earth, one of the freest countries on earth. And we've got to worry about corruption up and down our country now. That's why I said, you know, if it gets better for a while, just hold on. It'll change. It'll change. My Bible says it'll wax worse and worse. And I don't know, economic, uh, economic um, recovery or um, economic advance, that is not what I would call recovery of a nation. 
because it's not spiritual. For the thing to be real, for the thing to last, for the thing to have some real roots, it has to be spiritual. Do you see a nation turning back to God? I see a nation divided, and boy, we, you know, we're starting to, hey, listen, we may have to build a fence right down the middle of the country. Well, be more over toward the east and the west, and we'll be in the middle. <laughs> I mean, you cannot, you cannot believe the, how, wicked, how wicked this bunch is now that are, that's on these other sides of the fence. Who ever thought that you could abort a baby after it's been delivered and breathing on the table and have a discussion with the doctor and say, well, I just really don't want it. I just, I just don't, I don't have time for it. Okay, let's choke it to death while we're here. What, are they going to take it behind a curtain and then choke it to death? Or is he going to take a pair of scissors and jab it through the skull? I mean, that's how they used to do it. Who heard of such a thing? It's happening in our lifetime. Listen, we're talking about legally now. We're talking about our government legislating that kind of thing. This world is in opposition to, to God to the point where you can love one or the other, but you can't love both. You can't. So the Lord says, hey, now that you're saved, get that world out of your heart. Don't love the world. Don't love the things that are in the world. And you know why? Because Satan has control of it. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The devil is in control of this world. You say, why? Because God put him in control. God's never out of control. It's not like he, it's not like he uh, won it in a lottery. God put him in control. In Matthew 4, 4, the devil's offering Jesus Christ all the kingdoms of this world if he'll fall down and worship him. He couldn't have offered them to him lest he had them. But the Lord says, get thee behind me, Satan. I mean, the Lord knows. He says, they're yours for a while. Just do what you want to do, and then I'm coming back, and then you're giving them back to me, whether you like it or not. You see why the Lord put him in control? Because the world, the world is against him. The world rejects him. How's, how's the devil doing? You think this is the millennium? Like some crazy folks that I've been talking to? Man, talk about a horror of horrors. This better not be the millennium. They're getting, listen, they're getting exactly what they want. They want the world, God gives them the world. And the devil's running the show. Not only that, but this, this world does not love you. I know you may think it does. You may think they care about you, but they don't. Just tell them you're a Christian. Tell them you believe the Bible. Tell them you must be born again. Go ahead. Tell them. See what happens. Go ahead and tell them how they'll, they'll die and go to hell without Jesus Christ. Go, go on and tell them. See how they react to it. I mean, it's the truth, isn't it? Don't you believe that? To what the Bible says. You'll find out, 1 John 3, 13, marvel not, my brethren, if, he says, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. I mean, you shouldn't even be surprised by it. You know, they're putting Christians out wherever they can now. I don't know if you know this or not. I'm kind of getting held, uh, ahead of myself here just a little bit. Do you know that there are 11 Christians that die every day somewhere around the world? On the average, 11 Christians die every day. Now, it might be more than that, but I'm talking about from persecution. There's somebody killing them somewhere around the globe, and usually it's a bunch of Muslims. Isn't that interesting, you know? You get a few Muslims over there, and they get killed in, uh, where was that at, Australia or no, New Zealand. In New Zealand, you know, you get a couple Muslims killed, and the whole world has to mourn and drop their flags to half-staff. Listen, over in Africa, they're killing Christians every day and not a peep out of the media. Huh? It doesn't fit the narrative, exactly. And they'll get along with a Muslim while they hate you. Uh, what, one of the things is you'll find that enemies will bond together to hate, to be a, anything to get rid of Jesus Christ. Pilate and Herod were enemies until 
The issue came up about Jesus Christ, and by the end of the day, they were friends. Anything to get rid of him. And the world will do the same thing. You don't realize this thing's on a spiritual level you can't control. You think, you think well, if you just talk common sense, it ain't got nothing to do with common sense. It's a spiritual thing that's in the minds. It says the, the spirit that thou worketh in the children of disobedience. This thing goes on in the minds of people. They can't help it. They don't have the spirit of God, so what have they got? So the world hates your Savior. It definitely hates your Bible. They have done everything on this earth to stamp out the King James Bible. They've even tried, they've even tried to dilute it into a sea of translations so that you won't know which one. Go into a Bible bookstore and it's like, you know, you got the, the, the EVV, ENV, NIV, ASV, RSV, I mean, NRSV, New KJV. You got all, the, you're, you're just like a sea of a man. And you're looking for just that KGV, 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 KJV, not KGV. KGB is the KJV, KJV. And then you have to ask them. Oh, you find out it's, it's on the very lowest shelf in, you know, <laughs> behind the counter or someplace. Now, you can still get a King James Bible anywhere. You can, order, you can order it off the internet. You can go to a bookstore. But when you go to that bookstore, just look at the ones they've got that are prominent. Now, now, think about a Christian that doesn't know which one is the Bible. You can see why people are, Christians are being deceived. They hate your Bible. They've always hated the King. I'm talking about Christians that hate it. I'm talking about scholars that hate it. They don't like what it says. The first thing it says is that they are they which corrupt the Word of God. So they change the verse. Why? Because they're corrupting the Word of God. They don't like what it says over here. They don't like what it says over there. Oh, it's much too harsh. Oh, how can we say that? Oh, we can't talk about hell. Oh, lake of fire. Oh my gosh, let's change that. And Jesus, 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 can't we take that out a few times? I mean, they took the Lord out of the mouth of the, of the thief on the cross, you know, saying, Lord, remember me when thou comest in the... They took the word Lord right out of his mouth. They attack every doctrine. These new translations attack every doctrine in the Bible. Every doctrine. All they have to do is cast doubt on it. They don't have to attack it every place. They just have to attack it once. Because this is supposed to be the infallible word of God. Now your virgin birth has been called in question. Now the ascension of Christ is called in question. The resurrection is called in question. Uh, his uh, um, his uh, virgin birth, his ascension, uh, his second coming. Attack, 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 attack. So when you pick up a new Bible, you'll wind up practically an agnostic or an atheist. Why? They hate it. Or they never would have produced that piece of trash. They wouldn't have produced it in the first place because we already have it. We already have the Bible. The one that God's been using. If this is the one God's using, I don't care about the rest of them, do you? I just want to use the one God uses. God uses this book. That's what he's been using. The world hates it. And you know what? The world will hate you if you stand for the Bible and you stand for the Lord. It'll hate you. All that live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why? This world is against you. I mean, it is against you. It does not love you. And you can never go back to being part of it. Peter even tried it, man. He tried warming his hands at their fire, you know. He even started cussing. He said, I don't know him. They said, your speech bereath you. <laughs> your speech betrays you. And I've seen you with him. You, you, you dress like one of them too. <laughs> Sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes you just look like a Christian. You can live carnal in this world and you can think you can get by and maybe you will for a while, but sooner or later it'll spit you out. After it's done with you, of course. Prodigal son's a good picture of that. He was a son. He decided he's going to take his inheritance and blow it. By the time the world got done with him, it's chewed him up and spit him out. He's happy to come back to the Father then. 
And he came back without his inheritance. That's a picture of a Christian that loses it all in this world. And when he goes back to the Father, guess what? Oh, he's a son. Welcome home, son. Love you. Put his arm around him. Glad you're home. It's good to see you. All oh, that inheritance? Oh, you, you spent it, right? Well, <laughs> that was it. You got something to lose, Christian, by loving the world. You got saved, you became a stranger to this world, and they don't know who you are. 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. They don't know what you are anymore. They don't know who you are anymore. Here's the other thing. This world killed your Savior. John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. John 1 says he was in the world. The world was made by him. The world knew him not. He came into his own. His own received him not. Christians are killed all the time in this world. You know what you hear about it on the news? Crickets. Not a thing. Because they don't care about you. They killed your Savior. And listen, listen, listen. If the religions, I mean the major religions of this world, ever get complete control, like, um, I'm trying to think of, um, give me a country in Africa, not Zimbabwe or not... Uh, Huh? Keep going. Nigeria. Nigeria is where the Muslims... Nigeria has a, a good population of Christians in it. And in Nigeria, the Muslims are going in, going in and killing people, uh, cr killing Christians in the villages. Did you hear about it on the news? Do you ever hear about it? They go in and wipe out a whole Christian village? Did you hear about it? You're not going to hear about it. But you'll hear about a few Muslims got killed in a mosque somewhere in the world, and the whole world had to just, oh, how horrible. We need to join hands with these poor Muslims. Just, oh. But their same Muslim brothers are over there killing Christians, and nobody's saying a word about it. And I mean killing them a lot worse than getting shooting them. I'm not happy about what happened over there. But nobody ever seems to see the, see the full picture. And the reason is, is this world will side with a Muslim over you. Any day of the week, hey, they'll side with somebody from ISIS over you. ISIS. They say they're, still, they're not around anymore. We'll see. Another reason not to love the world is this world is sure to pass away. And that is you're, you're kind of wasting your time and energy on this world. If that's all you got, you're wasting your time and energy on it. Why? It's going to pass away. No matter what you build here, not against you building something here. No matter what you have here, and I don't mind you having, God don't mind you having something here. But if that's all you're going to do, you're wasting your time and your energy. Why? It's going to pass away, man. 1 John 2, 17, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We just read that. We read that verse. Doing the will of God, doing the things that please God, doing the things that are eternal, that lasts forever. Is a soul, does a soul last forever? Maybe you ought to concentrate on a few of those. The word of God is eternal. And the Bible says it's eternal in the heavens. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall... That's eternal. Maybe you ought to spend some time with that. See, you know, there are some eternal things that you can spend time with. Souls being one of them. The scriptures being another. Holy Spirit's eternal. Spend some time in fellowship with Him. In fellowship with Jesus Christ. Uh, this world system we know is temporal, the things, but the things of God are eternal. And 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but, on, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I know that's not easy. 
But by faith, you have to believe that. The things that are seen are temporal. They're going to burn up. They're not going to last. Everything you see will be demolished and destroyed. So why are you laying up treasure here on earth? I mean, why, why waste everything? Why all your energy, all your strength, why would you waste it just on the things of this world when it's going to pass away? Wouldn't you want to do something for the Lord? Wouldn't you want to do... Listen, when one soul, and that's one eternal thing you take with you. Can't take anything else. Can't bury your money with you. You know? And then they can't bury your money with you because the taxes are going to take it from you or your, your, your kin are going to take it from you. Your kids will take it from you. Everybody takes your money. But you can't take it with you. Uh, the last thing is the world's the reason the reason you shouldn't love the world is the according to the Lord the world is not even worthy of a prayer. That's pretty sad, isn't it? When when Jesus Christ Himself won't pray for the world, He said in John seventeen nine, "I pray for them," talking about the disciples. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. He said, I am not even going to send up, bless them, Lord. You know, bless the world, Lord. He said, I ain't going to do it. He said, I'm not going to pray for this world. That's how much in opposition it is to God. If it's not worthy of a prayer, then why are you wasting all your time in it? Thinking about it, planning, trying to make the best of it. He said in Matthew 6, 21, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Hmm. I'm thinking, if everything you have is down here and that's where your heart is, that's where your love is. Instead of where it should be. Well, I can tell you about the treasures down here. You can't take them with you, and they won't last. Whatever you got, it'll break, rust, get stolen, <laughs> you know, um, be outdated. You can't hardly keep a phone for two months now, man. It's already outdated. I've never had anything that didn't break. Anybody own anything that didn't break? I, I've, I've had a, I, I broke an anvil before. It was a small one, but I broke it. Break anything. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I guess I'm just trying to encourage you to consider the things that are eternal. Consider the things that are not of this world. Consider the things that... One of these days you're leaving. And what are you going to take with you? What are you going to take with you? Love not the world... Let's all stand. All right, we're going to dismiss in prayer. Let's have a word of prayer. Father.